Today's reading is from Acts chapter 17, starting to read at verse 22, um, going to verse 31, which I think can be found on page 1113. <coughs> Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breadth and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, which is probably most of you, to be fair, um, my name is Angela, and I've been coming here to Sunnyside for a couple of years now, as Sharon said, and uh, I just want to say thank you for such a warm welcome that you've all given me. It's lovely to be here with you today. Let's just pray. Father, we pray now that in these moments, we might listen carefully to what you have to say to each one of us that you would still our hearts, that we would hear your voice and then have the courage to do all that you ask of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I love a bit of good news. Most people do, don't they? And when we have good news, we love to share it. A few months ago, my son and daughter-in-law told me the good news that they're expecting a baby. I'm sure I'm not old enough to be a granny, but even so, it was good news. And I was bursting at the seams. I was desperate to tell people this good news uh, that they'd shared with me. Good news is hard to contain, isn't it? And whether that's an expected baby or a sale in our favorite shop or uh, good news from a health concern or maybe a new job, when we have good news, we're desperate to share it. Good news can be hard to find sometimes, can't it? It can feel like all the news around us is bad. We hear news of war and persecution, of famine and natural disasters, war of terrorist attacks and all sorts of awful bad things and it can all feel a bit overwhelming. But we have the best news ever. We have good news that outshines all other good news and news that is still good, even when all other news can seem bad. I wonder when it comes to good news about Jesus, whether you're bursting at the seams, or whether you're hesitant. Maybe we're hesitant because we might think that other people think we're a little bit crazy. Maybe we're a bit embarrassed about what people might think of us. Maybe we just find it difficult and we don't know where to start. Well, today we're continuing this mini-sermon series from Acts 17, and we're going to look together at a time when Paul shared something of the good news. And we're going to see if we can find some tips and some encouragements and some insights from him and from God's word, so that we might leave here bursting at the seams, ready to tell people the good news about God. So just a very brief recap of where we are in scripture. At this point, you'll all know that Jesus had died, he'd risen, he'd ascended uh, to the Father. 
the disciples were busy setting up the early church and helping people understand the context of the Old Testament teachings in line with what they'd seen and were beginning to understand of Jesus. Some of the people were excited by that and some felt threatened and unsure about that. But the Jews and the Gentiles alike were being encouraged to repent and be baptized. The Holy Spirit was working in people's lives. There were signs and wonders and healings. And Paul, following his conversion, was bursting at the seams, wanting to tell people about this God that he had met. And so with his companions, he was traveling around Greece, telling people the good news which it has to be said wasn't always received well, was it? The good news was often met with beatings and torture, arresting and persecution, and some people were even killed, but don't let that put you off. So today we're going to look at this passage, and if you want to turn uh, in your Bibles to it, it's on page 113. And we're going to look together to see what we can uh, be encouraged by. So Paul had arrived in Athens and he'd noticed the objects of worship there. The ancient gods worshipped many idols and had many objects of worship to help them in their religion. Each of them had a distinct personality and a domain. So they had a god of the sea and a god of carpentry, a god of hunting and a god of war, a god of wine and a god of music. They had a god for everything. And their idea was that if they worshipped the God of that particular thing, that particular God and thing would be good to them. And it was here that Paul noticed their altar to the unknown God. And this would most likely have been built in a a superstitious way um, so that the Greeks had all bases covered. A place to worship anything or anyone that hadn't been encompassed in one of the other objects of worship. A place to worship something that they might have missed or that they didn't know or that they didn't understand. They did this so that no God was left out and no God was offended. So all bases were covered. And it's from Paul's visit to the altar of the unknown God that I think we can learn something today about how we share the good news thousands of years later that Paul shared then and we can share now. I don't know about you, but I find it really hard to share the good news about Jesus. Maybe you do too. Let's look a little bit at why that might be first. So as we said, Paul faced beatings and jail if he shared the good news. We perhaps don't face those challenges, but we do face challenges for sure. We live in a world, don't we, where there seems to be no absolute truth anymore. Your truth is right for you and my truth is right for me. We live in a world where everything and anything is acceptable or quickly justified. We live in a world that is so frantic, where the expectation of self is so high, where all our questions can be answered by Googling them, where everything is disposable and easily replaceable, where there's a strong sense of entitlement. We live in a world of multicultures, multi-sexual orientations, multi-backgrounds, multi-faith. We live in a world where we believe we can do it all, have it all, know it all, and be all that we want to be. We live in a world of self-sufficiency. And so it's easy to see why some people find it hard to share the good news about Jesus. Many would ask themselves, why, when I can already have it all on my own, why do I need Jesus? Why is this good news for me? News has to have a positive impact on lives, doesn't it, for it to be good. So how can we help people see that there is still a need for God? How can we help people see that the good news is indeed good for them? How can we share this in a way that is relevant and in a way that is accepted in the cultures and lifestyles in which we live. Well, let's look at what Paul did in Athens to see if that will help. So Paul took note. Paul noticed. 
He spent time walking around the area that he'd arrived in. He took it all in. It says in the Bible, Paul looked carefully. It doesn't say he listened, but I'm sure he did because looking and listening goes together. He looked and he listened and learned about what the objects of worship that he saw were all about. Paul didn't just rush in with his good news. He carefully noticed his surroundings. He noticed where the people were at, how they lived, what they did, what was going on for them. Wow, how often do we rush into a situation of any kind from our point of view, our understanding, our beliefs, our knowledge? Paul didn't do that. He carefully noticed where the people were at. Could we learn from this? How might it be if we took time to carefully notice where our friends and family were at? How might it feel to ask them about their beliefs before, before trying to convince them of ours? How might it be to let them tell us why they think this or that? To be curious about their lifestyles, their choices, their thoughts, their feelings, their doubts. How might we go about listening to how their belief system makes them feel? or what their way of life gives them that they love and wouldn't want to change? How might it be to listen and look carefully without judgment or bias, just to see where people are at? Because if we listen, if we truly listen and look, if we notice where they're at, then I believe we're more likely to find their unknown God, their altar to their unknown God. The thing that's missing, the thing that's unknown, the basis that they haven't got covered by their self-sufficiency. And that is where we, like Paul, can start. In simpler terms, I think it's about building a relationship with someone first. Understanding them, listening to them, giving them space to share themselves with us before we share ourselves with them. And when we listen, when we truly listen, we might find the thing that's missing for them. We might find the peace that they're missing, the joy, the hope. Maybe we'll find the sense of belonging or sense of purpose that is missing for them. Maybe we'll find the strength or the comfort or the desire to live forever that's missing for them. Paul said to the Greeks, this unknown altar, this altar rather, to the unknown God, the thing that was missing, what you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you as the one true living God, God over all. Likewise, when we discover what is missing in our friends and family's life, where they're at, what's missing for them, we can proclaim the good news into that space. Not that Jesus gives us everything that we want. We all know that that's not true. That's not how it feels, at least. But Jesus does complete us if we allow him to. He does make us whole. No matter who we are or or where we're at, we're created by God, by the living God. And we have a God-shaped hole in our lives, a desire to have a relationship with him is inbuilt when he made us. Sometimes we don't know that or we don't recognize it or we give it different words like life makes no sense or why does it matter anyway or I wish I knew what I was all about. And so despite the many ways and attempts at self-sufficiency, there will always be an incompleteness within us if we don't have a relationship with Jesus. When people don't notice that incompleteness, they don't notice they need Jesus, and they can't see why this news is good for them. So as we listen and notice and look carefully, we can help them identify the God-shaped space in their life, their unknown altar, the thing that is missing, and there where there is space, there where there is something incomplete 
we can share the good news and it is more readily accepted when people can see that there is something missing. We can start there, where they are. Not shying away from ways of life we don't understand or beliefs we disagree with or morals we can't accept or people we find it hard to love or situations that might be tricky. Not hiding in our churches and our cosy Christian circles where it's easy to talk about Jesus. But going to places, mixing with people, taking an interest, being curious about where people are at in their life listening and looking and noticing carefully, understanding their world before we share our world with them. And then the good news is more likely to be accepted or at least considered. The good news that despite all their attempts at being complete, there is more out there for them. There is a God who loves them and longs for them to seek him and have a relationship with him and know him as the one true living God. There is news. It is good and it's good news for all. And when Paul found this inroad that was relevant to the Greeks, he shared basic core truths and he offered an all-inclusive message in which he aligns himself with the people of Athens. He wasn't preaching at them, he wasn't publicly judging them. He wasn't condemning them or denying their choices or their life as it was. In fact, he said at the beginning, I see you are very religious. He made a connection with them. He listened, he was curious about it all and he noticed and then into that mix of where the people were already at he proclaimed the one true living God. The God, it says, who made heaven and earth, the God who made the world and everything in it, and from whom all good things have come. The God who made each of them, the God who knew them and planned and gave every moment of their lives, the God who did all this and more so that man might seek him and have a relationship with him. And Paul, in his inclusive language, effectively says he is our God. We are his offspring. Not if you change your ways, God will forgive you. If you do it my way, God will love you. If you do this, God will bless you. None of that. Paul says, for in him, in God, we live and move and have our being. We are his offspring. Such inclusive language and one simple core truth from which the people can then seek him more. Paul was saying to the Greeks, that unknown God that you worship to cover all bases, I proclaim him now to you as the one true living God who has got all bases covered. God has got all all bases covered in Jesus. Jesus came to live amongst us to show us the way. He died that our sins might be forgiven. He rose again to conquer death. And he left his Holy Spirit with us that we might know, never be alone in this world. And he prepares our place in heaven with him that we might be with him and live forever. That's why this is good news. It's why it was good news then and it's why it's good news today. He makes us complete. We don't need to explain every last bit of theology to people to share the good news with them. It's all about relationship. All we need to do is build a relationship with other people and encourage them to build a relationship with God. The God that longs for them to seek him and that can make them complete. This week, may we really truly take time to listen and look and notice carefully where others are at, to begin to discover where their altars are to their unknown gods, the thing that is missing or incomplete for them. And into that space, may we take every opportunity that God gives us to share the good news of the God that loves them and longs for them to seek him. We are his offspring, and we have good news to share. 
So may God give us wisdom and courage and opportunities this week to share the good news with the people that we share our lives with.